Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, you will, we will serve the Lord. Galatians 5, 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Amen. If you have your Bible this morning, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to the 121st Division of the Psalms, Psalm 121. This is a psalm that we have visited before in the past, but the Lord has laid it upon my heart for this morning, and to look at it from a little bit different perspective or different angle. I always said this, the Word of God never changes, but sometimes the way God applies it to our heart can be different from circumstance to circumstance, from day to day. And I'm thankful that His Word is living, and He knows what we stand in need of and when we stand in need of it. And it's amazing how He can take uh, one portion of Scripture, and He can take and apply to it in our hearts in so many different ways. And we're grateful that He knows what we stand in need of. Let's all stand together this morning, Psalm 121. And Psalm 121. And I want to preach this morning as the Lord gives liberty about our source of help, or uh, rather, our help for the journey. There's not a one of us today that doesn't need help from time to time. And if you're like me, you need help all the time. And here in Psalm 121, the psalmist, he says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Amen. Brother Jerry, would you pray for us, please, sir? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this very day. Lord, we just thank you for every blessing. Lord, we thank you that we can always know, Lord, that there's not a trial we face. Lord, yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you that no matter what we're going through, Lord, you've been there, Lord. You know about it. Lord, you know about us. Lord, we know you love us. You care for us. You hear our prayers. Lord, I just pray today that you give the pastor liberty. Lord, I pray for that one that may be here, Lord, lost. Lord, <clears throat> never give their heart to you. Lord, I pray today that you convict that soul. Yes, dear Lord. Lord today would be that very day. Of yes, Lord. grant it, Lord. Lord, we just ask you to bless us. Go with us through this preaching hour, Lord. We just give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We come to Psalm 121. We find the psalmist that he uses the word help on a different, a couple of different occasions that he asked the question, from whence cometh my help? And then he answers that question by saying, my help cometh from the Lord, uh, which made heaven and earth. Uh, when it comes to that word help, uh, that they have said that it's one of the most powerful words that we have in our English language, uh, that it can have so many types of application from a simple asking for somebody's assistance and service to uh, an emergency cry of despair for somebody to come to alongside to one's aid and rescue. Uh, it could be used of a mother uh, that has perhaps five small children and the husband is away with work and she's left to take care of those children and feed the cows and, and the cats and the dogs and the chickens and she comes to a place and throws up her hands and say, I've got to have some help. It may come from that college student that has uh, studied a uh, day and night uh, for long hours and prepared for that final examination and finally sat down to take the test and realizing and discovering that they have studied the wrong chapters. Need some help. It may come from uh, that man, uh, that desperate dad who's sitting at the kitchen table and he's surrounded by unpaid bills and he's looking at those children who have, has mouths to feed and he's thinking about uh, the bank account on how there's no money there. And uh, he's tried uh, for, uh, to apply for jobs, and there's no prospect of job in the future. And he's sitting there with his uh, face in his hands, and he's saying, I need some help. Maybe it's that woman that uh, she has been faithful and dedicated to her home and her husband. And she's given her heart uh, and poured it out to, to make it the best she can. And for 25 years, 
uh, things have moved forward. And then one day the husband comes in and looks at his wife and says, I no longer love you that I have given my love to somebody else and I'm leaving you. And this woman says, how in the world am I going to get through this that I have to have some help? Maybe today it's somebody that has some besetting sin, or whether it be drugs or alcohol or any other uh, sin, if you will, and they've tried everything they can, and, say, and they've come to a place and said, I don't have an addiction. I can stop anytime I want to. I just don't want to. And then one day they say, enough's enough, and I'm ready to get away from this and find out uh, that the sins, the chains of sin, are too light to be felt until they become too heavy to be broken, and say, I have to have some help. I cannot do this on my own. You know, sometimes the best place to get help is whenever you admit that I need help. And there's times that we uh, that we become independent and self-sufficient. And, and I realize that there's people out here in the world today that they make no effort to try to help themselves, that they're only wanting a handout and they're only wanting somebody to... And I understand there is some folk like that, but I also say that there's some good, honest folk that are genuine and sincere uh, in heart that desperately need help. And they may not ever ask for it, but you and I need to be discerning of God and try to, uh, to take note when the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart and help individuals. And you may not have any clue whatsoever that they need anything. And God says, give them this. And they all of a sudden bust out in tears and say, I'm so thankful that God heard my prayers. What I'm saying is there's times that we become independent and self-sufficient and we don't want to ask for help. But there never should be a time that we fail to go to God and ask Him for help. Why? Because He has told us that we are to cast all of our care upon Him, for He careth for us. Don't ever think that God doesn't care because He does. Uh, there's some things that you and I uh, simply can't help in. There's things in our own lives that we cannot control and we can't help. There's others that we love and care about and we want to try to help them and meet the needs they have. But you and I, that we understand there's certain needs that we can't meet. Uh, we're limited in our resources. We're limited in our abilities. And when it comes to salvation of a soul, there's not one person that you and I can save, but thank God we know who can. And when it comes to healing a sickness, you and I, we can't heal that sickness, but we know, uh, thank God, who can. When it comes to certain needs, we may not be able to provide for that need, but we know a God in heaven that is able to supply all of our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Uh, when I look at this passage of scripture, I wonder this morning, uh, how many in here has ever come to a time in your life in a place where you needed some help? And maybe you didn't let it be known, but you prayed to God and asked him to help. And uh, maybe there's times that you needed help and you knew it didn't matter who you call or who you talk to, that the only one that had the ability to meet your need and help you was God in heaven. And you went to him first because you knew there wasn't anybody else to go to. And uh, you called upon his name and you asked him to help. And he said, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And you and I can testify this morning to the faithfulness and the ability of God, and how many times that he's met our need over and over again. And thank God when it comes to the ultimate deliverance and salvation of the soul. And I'm thankful that he saved this old sinner. But not only has he done it before, but thank God he'll do it again. But when we look in Psalm 121, uh, the psalmist is in a place of, of um, uncertainty. Uh, there's some things going on here in the psalm that... Uh, the psalmist, I believe, uh, was in dire need of help, not just on one occasion, but probably like us on every single occasion during those times and during uh, those days that uh, battles were not uncommon. Uh, they would uh, be going off and one day everything seems to be fine. The next day the enemy has attacked and they were familiar with battle. They were familiar with bloodshed. Uh, they knew about surrender and siege. They knew about unceasing wars and famine, uh, all kind of things that they were familiar with and knew uh, that they needed help along the journey and understood, the psalmist here understood that God was his source and supply of help. Uh, when you think about Psalm 121, we find in the heading of the psalm, it says a song of degrees. And you may remember from past studies that uh, there's a collection of 15 psalms that bear this heading. And uh, there's songs that were sang as the children of Israel would make their journey from different places to go to Jerusalem uh, three different times of the year to celebrate uh, in the, uh, the Feast of Passover and the Feast of Pentecost and the Feast of Tabernacles. And they would go up and beginning in Psalm 120 to Psalm uh, 134, they would sing this collection of 15 psalms. And the reason being is because it offered them encouragement. It offered them hope. It offered them some security that need, they needed along their journey. 
Uh, it's interesting because uh, it said for the most part that those that came to participate in the Passover, the biggest majority of the people lived down at the bottom. And in other words, when they traveled, they traveled upward. It said it was about a 2,700 uh, feet uh, difference between the elevation of where they were coming from to where they was going. They were on an upward journey. Uh, they were headed somewhere. They were headed up. They were headed somewhere. They were headed towards that Jerusalem, that city of peace. They were going there to meet with God. Uh, these psalms begin on a low note, and they're looking and lurking for the, the enemies lurking and looking, and then by the time we get to Psalm 134, they finally reach their desired destination. They've come to their haven of rest. They now have made it on their journey. They've reached uh, the other side. Uh, they've gotten there safely by the hand and grace of God, and we find them going into the sanctuary, and they're lifting up their hands, and they're praising God. Uh, why? Because of his faithfulness, because of his safety, because of his grace. And when I look at that, I think, you know, their journey was kind of like the notes uh, in the scale of music. They start out, and they get a little higher and a little higher as the scale progresses. And that's how it is in our Christian life. When God came to us, we were on the very bottom. Wouldn't you agree with that? We were dead in our trespass and sin. God saved us by his grace. Uh, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he began working on us. Uh, he begins to take us step by step. And thank God we're getting a little bit closer to home every day. But along the journey, there's difficulties that we'll face. But I'm saying that we're on a journey. And thank God we're not heading down, but we're heading up. The only thing that's going up in this world today is the church. Everything else, the economy, uh, the governments, uh, uh, all this other stuff is going down. It's going down fast, but thank God one day soon we're going out of here. And one day we're going to reach our desired haven of rest. We're going to be home in heaven and glory where he said we'd be. Now he said that where I am, there you may be also. And we're going to lift our hands and lift our voices in praise. And we're going to bow at his feet. And we're going to sing holy, 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 and worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain. A help for the journey. Now, when I uh, think about these uh, psalms, that these psalms are songs that were sang on their journey. They would offer encouragement and hope that God's people needed along the way. I wonder today, has God ever given you a song to help you through a difficult time? Well, I see a lot of heads shaking. Something in your life that you was going through and you heard a song and boy, it registered. It struck a note in your heart and you caught yourself listening to that song over and over and over again, reminding yourself of the faithfulness and the grace and the promises of God. And you're singing that song and you're meditating on that song and you're pondering that song. Why? Because that song was scripturally based and went along with what the word of God teaches us. These songs would provide them help. Now, there's at least three truths here in these verses that I believe that will carry you through the stormy seas and through the troubled valleys of your life. Some wonderful reminders that not only uh, the word they reminded of when they would sing these songs, but I believe today that we ought to be reminded of just as well. First of all, that we need to be reminded as they were reminded uh, that the Lord, the Lord himself is our provider. He's our provider. Uh, there's a, a lot of difficulties and dangers and troubles and uncertainties. If we're not careful, we'll find ourselves looking uh, in every place except for the right place for our help. If you're not careful, you'll find yourself uh, asking uh, uh, many people rather than going to the only person that can help. I, I believe today that if you have a real need in your heart, the very first place you ought to take it is to Jesus Christ. I think a lot of people has come to the conclusion, well, I better call and check with mom and check with dad and check with grandma and check with grandpa and see if the church can help and see. And, I, and I'm not against those things, but I say the very first place you ought to go to is the Lord. And uh, he's our source of help. As parents, we need to teach our children uh, there are certain things mom and dad cannot take care of, certain things mom and dad cannot fix. But let us show you and share with you the one that can meet every need that you have and can provide for you the answer to every question uh, that you might have. Uh, that is the Lord. Now notice in verse number one, the psalmist said, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. And then says, from whence cometh my help? Now if you read that verse too fast, it appears that I'll lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. And the, the implication of what it seems on the surface is the psalmist is thinking that the help comes from the hills. But that's not what the psalmist is saying. Not what the psalmist is saying at all. The psalmist says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. Now why are they looking to the hills? Because on their journey, 
on their way to Jerusalem, uh, that the enemy would often be hiding and lurking in the hills. They would hide behind the trees. They would hide behind the rocks. They would hide in the caves. They would hide uh, over the top of the crest of the hill. And here comes these travelers, and they're making their way to Jerusalem to participate in the things that God has ordained for them to participate in. And everything's smooth sailing, and they're going fine, and everything's well. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere comes the enemy. And before you know it, they've been pranced on, being attacked, being robbed, being threatened, and being ambushed, and all that stuff. And so don't you know it'd be natural, as you're on your journey, just like if you were out here in the woods today, you'd be looking for snakes and alligators and everything else. They're looking for the enemy. I believe today that we ought to be, be sober, be vigilant, to be watching because our adversary has a roaring lion is seeking whom he may devour. Uh, he said, I will look into the hills. Why? Because the enemy could come and attack at any time. But if the enemy does come, and it's not unlikely that he'll come, it's probable that he will come. When he does come, what are we going to do? Because most likely the enemy is going to possess more power and more uh, ability than what we have. The enemy is going to be stronger and more mightier than what we are. And if the enemy comes, and when the enemy comes, uh, where are we going to turn to from help? He said, I will lift mine eyes unto the hills. And then he asked the question, from whence cometh my help? Where am I going to get help? Who is going to be able to help me in this situation? There's nobody I can call on that can come. My family's too far away or uh, this and that. But then he says, my help cometh from the Lord, uh, which, make, which made the heaven and the earth. Uh, he realizes that our source and supply. You know, there's a lot of problems today that's faced in society, and we could go on and on and on and on down the list. Uh, we'd have to say that uh, the average home today is facing all kinds of problems and difficulties. Churches today are facing challenges and problems and difficulties. Uh, there's no doubt today we ought to get a big amen that our government is uh, certainly uh, facing some challenges and difficulties and in need of some di divine help from heaven. Uh, when it comes to nations around us, I get these mission letters, and not only is the United States in a mess today, but these other nations, they're in a mess uh, just as well. And I'm going to tell you this, the answer to these dilemmas is not about who's voted in and who's voted out. The answer to these questions is the one that has the ultimate power and the ability to help, and what we need is revival. When it comes to uh, children and it comes to families that all are in need of help, uh, but the answers to the problems that we face are not going to be found uh, in the hills of humanistic living. Uh, they're not going to be found in the halls uh, of uh, uh, higher learning and education. But I believe the help that we need today to help us uh, to overcome the problems that we face are going to be found in the help of a holy, living, almighty God who's on the throne, who cares about us, and is concerned about us. The psalmist is not saying I'm going to look to the hills for my help. But he says I'm going to look to the hills. And then says that my help cometh from the Lord. Let me read right quick Jeremiah. Listen to what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 23. He said truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills. He said I can't get salvation from the hills. He said I'm from the multitude of mountains. He said my, my help, my salvation, my deliverance is not going to come from there. But he said, truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. And what's Jeremiah saying? Jeremiah saying the answer to my problem is not going to be found over here. And the answer to my problem is not going to be found over here. And the answer to my problem is not going to be found over there. But he said the answer to my problem is going to be found in the God of heaven. The Lord of my salvation. Uh, whenever we think about the resources that we have in God, that there's some things that we're reminded of here, beginning in verse number two, that first of all, thank God for those that are trusting in the Lord, that you and I have security. Verse number two, he says, my help cometh from the Lord. It doesn't just stop there. But he says, which made heaven and earth. Now, you ever wonder why the psalmist went on to speak about that? It doesn't just come from the Lord. He could have said that and it would have been fine. But he said, which made heaven and earth the earth. What he's realizing this morning is what you and I need to understand, that the greatest source and greatest supply of help that we can ever have comes from the creator of the universe. By the way, if he spoke everything into existence, if he can take by the span of his hand, measure out the, uh, the mountains, and in the palm of his hand, the hollow of his hand, met out the waters, 
If, if he can take and, and breathe the breath of life into the nostril of man and man become a living soul, if God has the ability to create everything there is that is created, don't you know that he has the ability this morning to sustain everything that he's created and protect everything that he's created? You know, I, you and I, we belong to him twice. You say, how's that, preacher? That I'm his, thank God, through salvation, but I'm also his through creation. He created me, but then thank God he saved me. Uh, he made me, and then thank God he bought me with a price. Same as he done for you. But this security, uh, that uh, for one to be able to help, uh, first of all, one has to be able. Now, we, uh, we ask the question today, can God really meet my need? You know, one of the most foolish questions that was ever asked by the nation of Israel is in Psalm 78 when they said, Can God? Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? What in the world had God been doing all the days prior to that? taking care of them, putting raiment upon them, feeding them, protecting them. And then they had the, uh, the audacity to say, can God? You know what, whenever you and I are consumed in worry and doubt and we uh, something that we're facing, you know what we are? We're doubting God's ability to take care of us. Or maybe not his ability, but maybe we're doubting his willingness. I'm going to say thank God this morning. Not only is God able, but God is willing to help us. Doesn't mean he's going to meet every need the way we want it to be met, but it does mean that God's going to take care of us in a way that we need to be taken care of. Now listen to what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 32. It's a wonderful promise. Uh, Jeremiah 32, let me find my place here. I want to read this verse. Uh, Jeremiah 32, and in verse number 17, Jeremiah says, Oh, Lord God, he said, Behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretch thou arm. Then listen what he says. And there is nothing too hard for thee. Jeremiah said, when I look and I see that all that you've created, Lord, and I realize that you're the only one that has creative power. You know, the devil's an imitator, but he's not a creator. There's, not only, there's only one that has creative power, and that's God himself. And Jeremiah says, when I look at all that you've created, he said, I have to come to the conclusion that there's not anything that's too hard for you. I say, Jeremiah hit the nail right on the head, and I agree with that, that God's greater than higher than the highest hill, greater than the uh, most grand uh, uh, general and soldier. And by the way, if God created this world, don't you know today that God controls this world? God rules and God overrules, and he overrides. But not only is there security found in the fact that our help comes from the Lord, but there's also stability. Look in verse number three. It said, he will not suffer thy foot to be moved. Now, the, the, the idea of a foot to be moved uh, has the idea of one that's slipping or sliding. Uh, for these weary travelers, they're going up the mountainside, and they're going around the, the, the beaten path, and there's certain uh, cliffs, and there's rocks that are loose, and it would have been a lot of uh, uh, dangers, a lot of uh, different obstacles that had to be overcome. It would be real easy to lose one's footing, be real easy to, to slip, be real easy to fall. And what they realize is they need some stability to get them on the journey. Uh, I, I think about the times that you and I have went through the dangers of life. Uh, I don't think any of us would be here today if it wasn't for the stability of God, for the grace of God. There's times we may have even fell down, but God has picked us up and put us back on the journey. Times that we might have fallen, but God had us by the hand, and before we could ever hit the ground, God already had us back on our feet. And I think what John Newton sang about, and he said, through many dangers, toils, and snares, he said, I have already come. He said, tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Uh, I, I think about uh, here uh, that uh, God is our support and our stability. It's why we know that he's our solid rock. In the book of Proverbs, uh, I want to read a couple of verses there in the book of Proverbs uh, that uh, the Word of God speaks about uh, some wonderful things uh, in regards to the Lord's stability that He gives us. Proverbs chapter number 3 and in verse number 23, the Word of God says, Then shalt thou walk in the way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou, thou shalt lie down, and thou, uh, thy sleep uh, shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked, when it cometh. Verse 26 says, For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot 
from being taken. What that means today is it means God is not only our security, but thank God he's our stability. But then in verse number three and four, we see that he's also our serenity. Look back at the text this morning. In verse number three, the word of God says, verse three says, he will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Now, we, uh, we think about the word of God says he will not slumber. But then in verse number four, it says he will not slumber nor sleep. Now, wouldn't you agree today that even the greatest of the parents lacks the ability to be able to keep their eye on their child 24 hours a day? That's why that when it comes time for that child to be put to rest, you put them in there and, you, and nowadays they got all these modern day technologies and they've got the cameras and the baby monitors and all the warning devices and mama and daddy goes in there and, and most of the time mama's in there and she still can't sleep because she can't see that child and what's going on. Looking at that little monitor, listening for that voice and, and all this. Uh, but uh, it's amazing that uh, sometimes, even in the midst of all this, that that child still somehow can get into mischief. Get out of that crib, get into it, and, and say, how in the world that happened? Because there's no way uh, that mom or dad can keep their eye on that child 24 hours a day. You say, I took my eye off you for one second. One second, and now look what you've got into. You ever heard the phrase, out of sight, out of mind? Can I say this morning that might be true when it comes to this world? But when it comes to God's children that thank God there's never, ever, ever a time that we're out of his sight, that he always has his eye upon us. And I say thank God this morning there's never, ever a time that we're out of his mind, that whether or not we realize that he's always thinking about us. Uh, he knows us by name. He knows the number of hair upon our head. Uh, he knows what we're feeling. He knows what we're facing. And thank God he knows what we're fighting. And he's the one that's able to help us. His eyes on us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, forever and ever. His eyes on us. The Lord is our provider. He provides stability and, and security and serenity. But thank God he's also our protector. Look in verse number five. Verse number five, the word of God says, the Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. Now there's several times in these verses that the word keep is used, three times in particular. The word keep here in the Hebrews means this, means to guard or protect. The psalmist said, the Lord is my keeper. He's the one that guards me, and he's the one that protects me. Could I say ultimately today that God is our keeper? Now, there's certain measures that we put in place, and we ought to, and we ought to use our minds rather than foolishness. But when it comes down right down to it, we're not going to be able to protect ourselves. You say, there ain't nobody going to get me, preacher. I've got one right here on my side. I got it. I got me. I tell you, you carry all the guns you want to. When it comes to your ultimate protection, it's going to be God. All the safety measures. You and I can take all the vaccines they are and carry all the guns they are. And we can take all the precautions they are. But when it comes right down to it, ultimately, our protector is he that keeps us. He guards us. He protects us. Uh, we find here uh, that uh, it speaks about uh, that Lord knows uh, our vulnerability and he knows that we're vulnerable on all sides. You know, uh, it says the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. In ancient times that uh, the warriors uh, had two particular weapons that they would carry with them. One was a sword and the other was a shield. Most commonly, the sword would be held in the right hand and that was their means for uh, offense. And the shield would be held in their left hand. That was their means for defense. Uh, the shield was to protect them. They could turn it here, turn it here. And the sword was over here. But the thing about it is, the sword takes care of this part. The shield takes care of this part. But the one part of their body that's left open and exposed and vulnerable is the right side. That's why whenever you'd have soldiers that were together, they even teach this in military. They teach it right flank, left flank. Uh, that uh, you get in position, or whether you got your rifles or whatever, uh, that first man's up here, second man's over here, back and forth, and everybody's covered. Everybody uh, has somebody's back except for that last person. They're open, exposed. 
And the psalmist said, the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. In other words, what he says, he says, God is protecting me in my weakest point. Did you know that's what God does? He knows our weakest area. And God is able to protect us. Uh, that the Lord, that he tells us in his word that whenever we're weak, that he's strong. And that God is able to watch over us. And there's times that we might be attacked by our foe, the enemy. There's times that we might even be attacked by our family. And believe it or not, there's times that we might be attacked by our friends. And they tell you, say, I got you back. And oh yeah, they got you back. But can I say this? The only one that really has you back is God himself. The shade upon your right hand. God said, I have you back. I have you front. I have your sides. He said, I've got this whole thing covered. And I've got my own you. Uh, the, the word shade here comes from the same word that means shadow. You ever saw them funny videos where they uh, a little child is introduced to their shadow for the first time? And some of them, they're not happy about it. I'm just going to tell you, they don't like it whatsoever. It's scary. It's a person with no eyes and no mouth and all this stuff, and they're right there chasing me everywhere I go. And uh, one of the videos I seen a little kid, I seen it shadow and screamed and took off running and was looking behind him and the shadow was chasing him everywhere they went and was screaming for desperation for mom or dad to get them and deliver them. And they couldn't get away from the shadow. Do you know what the Lord says? He said, I'm the shade upon your right hand. What are you saying? I'm saying, thank God I can't get away from him no matter where I go and what I do, that he's right there watching over me and watching over you and protecting us. Aren't you glad today you and I can't get away and out from under his care? I read an article here uh, not long ago. It was real interesting. And it was speaking about some of the uh, unique traditions of the American Indian. And they was telling some of their, uh, their stories about their traditions. And, uh, and they said one of the traditions were how they trained their young men to become the, the braves, if you will, or the, the warriors. They said they'd take that young boy and they would teach him how to hunt, teach him how to fish, teach him all kind of survival skills, but the real ultimate test would come when they reached the age of 13, and it would be on the night of their 13th birthday. So they would take that young brave, and they would blindfold him, and they would take him out in the middle of the most dense forest, and they'd wait till a night when the moon wasn't uh, out or one of, the, one of the darkest nights. And they would leave that young boy out there to make it all through the night on his own. Now, this would be the first time that he'd be away from his family. It'd be the first time that he was away from the security of the other tribe members that was uh, there to help protect and watch over. And they talked to one of these young men, and he gave his perspective. He said, I'll never forget. He said, when I took that blindfold off, he said, it was pitch black dark. He said, I, my heart was beating out of my chest. He said, I didn't want to admit to myself, but I was scared. He said, I could hear noises, but I couldn't see where they were coming from. He said, the leaves would rustle and the twigs would break and snap. And he said, all I could think about is this some kind of a, a wild predator getting ready to, uh, to attack me and to destroy me and take my life. He said, it seemed like it was forever, eternity, before the sun ever, the, the light ever began to, to, to come up and the, the first uh, rays of the dawning sun would come out. And he said, I remember on that one morning, he said, it finally got just a little bit light enough to where I could uh, make out some images. And he said, I, I recognize there was a flower over here. And he said, then I looked over here and there's a tree. And I looked over here and there's a path. And he said, I turned around and he said, my heart about failed. He said, there was somebody standing feet away from me with a bow and arrow armed. And he said, I had no idea who it was until I heard the voice. And he said, it was my daddy. It was my father. And he said, I said, Father. He said, I was so excited. I said, I didn't even hear you come. When did you get here? And he said, son, you didn't hear me come because I never left. He said, all night long. He said, I was right here. He said, but Father, I didn't see you and I didn't hear you. He said, you might not have saw me and you might not have heard me. He said, but there wasn't a second through this night that I wasn't there right there beside you. Can I say you and I will never go through the darkness that God's not somewhere standing in the shadows uh, watching out for us and watching over us. And I praise his holy name for that truth. Uh, what a wonderful Savior that you and I serve. Not only are we vulnerable on all sides that he's the shade upon our uh, right hand, but he also recognized verse number six. And I'm going to close right quick. The sun shall not smite thee by day, uh, nor the moon by night. 
And whenever they would travel, they would be out there in the sun, and the overexposure to the sun could cause them to have a heat stroke. Uh, I'm sure they didn't have all the things we have today and all this uh, hydration and all the sunscreens and all this stuff. They get heat stroke, get sick. God protect them. God protect them through that, through the elements and over the elements. But then he spoke about uh, the moon shall not smite thee by night. Uh, as the sun would bring about a, a sunstroke during the day, that they believed that the overexposure to the moon could affect the mind. You know, you think about the moon, they talk about lunar. A lunar eclipse, lunar this, lunar that. Do you know the word lunar is where they get the word lunatic? You know what that means? It means somebody that's having trouble with their mind. Not meaning any kind of a, a derogatory way or any kind of bad thing, but somebody that's having a trouble with their mind reasoning. Do you know that sometimes we have trouble with these physical bodies? But sometimes our biggest trouble is not with these bodies, it's with these minds. My grandma used to say that the idle mind is the devil's workshop. That's why our mind needs to be stayed on thee. He said, uh, keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And many times our mind plays tricks on us. And we think, oh, what if this happens? Or what if that happens? And, and on and on and on. And we worry about things that haven't even come to pass. And waste our time of fretting and sweating over things that God's already taken care of. And when it comes right down to it, I thank God he's able to keep us over the physical elements. And he's able to keep us when it comes to the mental uh, health just as well. The Lord is our provider. The Lord is our protector. Look at verse number 7 and 8. The Lord is our preserver. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. The word preserve here comes from a Hebrew word. It's the same word that the word keep comes from, uh, but it has a little bit different and deeper meaning. Uh, not only does God protect us, he keeps us, but thank God he continually and constantly preserves us. If you and I were to think today about who is the most heavily protected person that there is in the United States of America, and we'd have to say it'd probably be the president, no matter who it is in office at that time. The, the president always has a, a big a big to-do of CIA agents and secret force and, and all these undercover people, and, and they have the barricades and the motorcades and all the security measures. And you'd think it'd be impossible for anybody to get to the president. But when we look over history, there's been presidents that have been assassinated. Why? Because it don't matter how strong security is, the enemy can usually figure out a way to breach it and get through it amazes me when I go to the airport and I have to take off my shoes and empty my pockets and everything and they go through all your belongings. Uh, how in the world that people are still getting guns and knives and stuff on the airplanes? How is that possible? I'll tell you why. Because there's not any security that's made by man that is foolproof. And that's why it's so important that not only does God protect us, but thank God he preserves us. And if God's looking over you, then thank God things are going to be all right. Now that don't mean, listen, that don't mean that they're not ever going to have any trouble. Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer if I've overcome the world. What did Peter say? Peter said, beloved. He said, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as some strange thing which happened unto you. But even though we might go through the fire and through the trials, that God's able to preserve us spiritually. He said, that he protect us from all, preserve us from, uh, from all evil. He's able to protect us constantly. Verse number eight, the Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in. You know what that means? That means he's constantly, uh, continually. And then thank God, he's able to protect us and preserve us eternally. He said from this time forth and even forevermore. I say praise his name. I can say today, that I thank God I know where my help comes from. Amen. The question is, from whence cometh my help? And we should be able to declare my help comes from the Lord. Cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. I wonder today, maybe you're here and you need some help. If you're here today lost, you need help. The only one that can help you is the one who died for your sins. If you call upon his name, he'll hear you and come and save your wretched soul. Call unto me and I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Maybe there's somebody here today and you need help, you need forgiveness. And the only one that can forgive you is the 
God in heaven, cast it all, that tell us for if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Maybe today you've got a need. The Lord said, casting all you care upon Him, for He careth for you. James says, you have not because you ask not. Maybe you need healing, and the doctor says, I can't help you. And you need to turn to the great physician and say, God, I believe you still have the ability, and I'm calling on you. If it be your will, would you touch my body? Maybe today you know somebody that needs help. As much as you want to help them, you don't have the ability or the means. Why not ask God and pray on their behalf, prayers of intercession? And God, would you help them? Would you help them? Would you meet their need? Let's all stand together. We'll have this invitation.